It's um, it's really a privilege, uh, a, a great privilege to have um, uh, Mervyn King with us this evening. Uh, Lord King is, of, of course, an uh, esteemed economist and former British central banker. He, he worked in the Bank of England for, t for 22 years, arriving in 1991 to be chief economist, then, then rising to deputy governor and ultimately serving as governor for a decade. Uh, he was at the bank's helm during the tumultuous years when the Western banking system collapsed and the Great Recession followed. Uh, but his book, The, the End of Alchemy, uh, isn't uh, a behind-the-scenes memoir about the cataclysmic events of, of 2007 and 2008. Uh, instead, as, as Lord King says in the introduction, it's more a book about ideas uh, and what's still wrong with our system of money and banking and what fundamental changes are needed to ensure greater stability going forward. Lord King came to the, to the bank after a distinguished career in academia as a professor of economics at the London School of Economics and teaching stints at Cambridge, uh, Harvard, and MI MIT. In that sense, he's part of a recent group of uh, academic economists turned central bank chiefs that has included uh, Ben Bernanke uh, here uh, and Axel Weber in Germany. Since leaving the, the Bank of England in 2013, Lord King has returned to the London School of Economics and also is on the faculty at New York University. Uh, but just so everyone doesn't think he spends all his time immersed in economics textbooks, I should note that Lord King is a big sports fan, uh, rooting in soccer for Birmingham's Aston Villa and promoting and occasionally playing cricket. Uh, and I also read somewhere that... Um, that he used to play Alan Greenspan in tennis. Um, Lord King will be in conversation uh, here this evening with the Washington Post's David Ignatius, uh, who writes the, the best reported, most insightful column on foreign and national security affairs in, in the mainstream media today. Uh, David uh, also is an accomplished novelist, and if you haven't read any of his spy novels, including his most recent, The Director, uh, then you really should. Um, and, in, and in the interest, too, of full disclosure, uh, David was once a student of Professor King's. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mervyn King and David Ignatius. So, it is um, a testimony to Lord King's uh, patience, his brilliance is well established, but to his patience that he was my tutor when I was a graduate student at, at Cambridge and he put up with some of the dumbest uh, questions imaginable uh, for a, a professional uh, economist. Great training for write a book for non-economists. Uh, well, <laughs> here, here. Um, we have, this is a, a somber day with somber news, so we have a lighthearted subject tonight of economics to uh, distract people. I was trying to explain to my dad, who was sitting in the third row, just how uh, successful and significant Lord King has been. And I said, Pop, L Lord King is a member of the Order of the Garter. And my father knows uh, Britain well enough to know that that really is the ultimate honor for uh, an English British subject. Uh, and so it's a measure of what the Queen uh, herself and her establishment think of, uh, of Mervyn. Um, I want to uh, talk about all sorts of things in the book, but um, maybe you could just begin with the, the basic question of why you decided to write it. Well, that's a good question. Uh, is it, this is working. You can yeah. hear me fine. I didn't want to write an account of the crisis. We've got more than enough of those to fill all these bookshelves here. And I didn't want to write a, write a memoir either, because I really do think that the, that should be written by historians down the road who can have access to all the papers and write objectively about what actually happened in 2007 8 And as I thought about the crisis and reflected on it, both while I was still at the bank and afterwards, it did seem to me that this should be a book about economic ideas. I wanted to write about it. But I was prompted to do it by a conversation with my Chinese opposite number one day in Beijing. And um, David and I have played tennis over the years. And the, the sport for the elite in China is tennis. So in the middle of some 
tedious international meeting. I mean, they all were pretty tedious, but this one was especially <laughs> tedious. My opposite number said, why don't we go and play tennis? So we did. And um, I can tell you that in the state guest house, the facilities for playing tennis are unbelievable. I mean, Wimbledon and the US Open have nothing on the facilities <laughs> in Beijing for tennis. I have my own enormous dressing room, a bathroom and separate drawing room. And then we had a banquet afterwards. And so rather carried away by this, I, I said to my opposite number, I said, well, you'll, you'll remember the uh, famous story about Chow En Lai being asked what he thought about the French Revolution and was reputed to have said, too early to tell, although Ke Henry Kissinger <laughs> denies that. Um, <laughs> But I, I said to my opposite number, so what do you make of the Industrial Revolution? Because 500 years ago, China was the biggest, most prosperous country in the world. Um, but the Industrial Revolution, at which point GDP around the world started to rise, began in my country. What do you make of it? And he looked at me and said, well, we've learned a lot about the market economy and about competition and how these two factors, competition within a market economy, can boost productivity growth, and hence raise living standards. And we are keen to emulate that. But then he looked at me, at, with a, paused, and with, a, am sure, a sort of twinkle in his eye, said, but I'm not sure that you in the West have quite got the hang of money and banking yet. <laughs> and that was what prompted me to write the book. It inspired me to get going on it, because, of course, the crisis of 2008 is one we hear a lot about, but it was merely the latest in a very long series of crises in our monetary and banking system, which date back certainly to the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, in terms of monetary policy, the two biggest hyperinflations in history <coughs> were in the past 60 years. And the banking crisis in 2008 was arguably the biggest financial crisis ever in the history of the world. So these aren't things which are belong to the myths in history. They are current and recent, and we still suffer from them. I thought it, it might help people to understand the intellectual scope of the book if you uh, uh, early on explained what you mean by alchemy, uh, because that helps us to think with you about what banking uh, and finance really are. So obviously alchemy is, is conventionally described in terms of people turning base money into, into gold. In other words, pretending that something is what it isn't, in fact. And money is rather like that. I mean, I used to, when I spoke at schools, I'd take out a pound note or a 10 pound note and say to kids, what is this? And they'd all shout back, it's money. And I'd say, no, it's a piece of paper, look. And I'd pretend to tear it in two. And they'd say, no, stop, stop, it's money. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the difference between a piece of paper and money? And because you can buy stuff with it, they said. So essentially, there is something about money which is pretense. We trust it, and we trust it for good reason, because we trust the issue of money, some more than others, some governments more than other governments. But it's nothing intrinsically valuable in it. And we have the same problem with banks, which is we put our money into bank accounts, and we have deposits with the bank. And we believe if we went to the bank, we could take the money out. The trouble is, if we all went to the bank at the same time and asked for our money back, we wouldn't get it because it's been lent on to uh, businesses or households in the form of long-term loans. Banks borrow short, lend long. That's how they make money. But the problem is they're very vulnerable to the loss of trust or confidence in banks. And if we lose confidence, as many people did in banks in 2008, then there's no way they can repay the money. So there's an element of alchemy, of pretense, about the way we organize money and banking. One uh, fascinating uh, theme of this book is um, the crisis that you lived through as governor of the Bank of England in, in 2008 and, and 2009. I suspect that uh, many, maybe most people in the audience have seen and maybe also read The Big Short by Mervyn's friend, Michael Lewis. Former student. Um, and see, you know, just it, it, it helps to be a, a <laughs> former student of Mervyn King's. Um, but your account of how that uh, crisis happened is different from Michael's. Michael focuses on the creation of these synthetic instruments and the, the real estate bubble and 
the whole story that we've seen in the Big Short. You have a, a different account, and maybe you could um, uh, explain that. Explain how we got to 2008, 2009. Also, I think people would love to hear a little bit about your own life at the center of that storm uh, at the at the Bank of England. So. Michael's account is in many ways a typical American view of the crisis. I mean, Americans are very confident and dynamic, but there is a view that somehow the world is America. And I'm surprised at how many people in the US are willing to accept blame for the financial crisis on the grounds that it started here in the subprime mortgage market, extended to the wider US American financial system, and that was the story of the financial crisis. And I think that's a very partial view. I don't disagree with the story that Michael portrays about the subprime mortgage market, but the question is, how and why did that happen? Now, people didn't suddenly wake up one day and say, wouldn't it be fun to try and find people in the subprime market and lend to them? Basically, the story is, I think you go back to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at the time, people said, well, that's the end of communism, the end of socialism, famously, the end of history. Actually, it started a train of events that led to the biggest crisis in capitalism since the 1930s. And what I mean by that is that it was the period after which China, other Asian countries, the former Soviet Union, all decided that a market economy was a good idea. They wanted to get into it. They wanted to get into manufacturing and to produce uh, goods that they could trade in world markets and have large export surpluses, which was the route to economic growth pioneered by Japan and, and Korea. The consequence of that is that they were exported so much and their economies grew so rapidly that they were saving more than they were, cons uh, they were saving more than they were investing uh, and dumping the excess savings into the world capital market, something which Ben Bernanke talked about in the phrase savings glut. And that pushed down long-term interest rates. Real interest rates after allowing for inflation have historically almost always been in the range 3 to 4% a year. And that's been a key part of a market economy and providing an incentive to save and also a way of discriminating between good investments and bad investments. Good investments have to earn enough to justify the cost of finance. Bad investments aren't undertaken. But over 30 years, real interest rates just kept coming down and down. Now, we in the West were not entirely passive in this respect. We looked at what was going on. And we saw that we had trade deficits because many other countries insisted on export-led growth and trade surpluses. But instead of resisting this fall in real interest rates, what we did in the West, in, in central banks, was to say, well, you know, this is like a structural trade deficit. This is a, a drag on our growth. So we better cut our interest rates, especially short-term rates, to low levels to persuade people to spend today, to boost domestic spending, so that the high level of domestic demand, after subtracting the drag from a trade deficit, was just big enough to um, demand uh, output equal to our potential and ensure we could grow at a steady rate with stable inflation and steady employment. And so what we had was something that became known here as the great moderation. And the big mistake in all this was to confuse a stable outcome with a sustainable outcome. And although this was a stable outcome with steady unemployment and stable inflation and steady growth, it all looked the kind of things we'd, for years, we'd been trying to achieve after the inflationary 1970s, what was happening behind the scenes was that the imbalances between countries and within countries were building up. And a market economy cannot function with real interest rates that are just getting lower and lower and lower. And that happened before the crisis. And of course, it's happened since the crisis because the underlying Im imbalances here, what I call the disequilibrium, have not been corrected. So the result of the crisis was far from putting matters right to mean that the fall in interest rates just carried on, so that now there are many central banks in the world, especially in Europe and in Japan, which have actually got negative interest rates. And you know, if we carry on like this, before long, you'll all be receiving letters from your bank saying, you know, dear customer, we're most grateful to you for borrowing from us. And in return, our gratitude is to be expressed. I enclose a check for you know, $1,022 in gratitude for the fact that you've borrowed from us. This is not how a market economy can operate. 
And that's how the, the, the crisis built up because as interest rates fell and got lower and lower, then the prices of assets, which are essentially the future returns on those assets, dividends, whatever, simply got higher and higher. The discount rate at which we were discounting the future was getting lower. The price today, the value today of these future returns was getting higher and higher. So house prices went up, stock prices went up, bond prices went up, the price of art went up, price of fine wine went up, everything went up. And with it was a decision by people who wanted to buy these assets to borrow more to finance those purchases. So young people have no choice but to borrow more to buy the housing stock which they're buying from their parents' generation. So debt went up and banks you know, it, it, banks don't lend to people who don't want to borrow. People wanted to borrow more because they had to to finance the purchases of assets. And so the banking system was encouraged to extend lending. They themselves borrowed more to finance that lending. And what is called the leverage of banks, that is the extent to which banks themselves are financed by, by borrowing, got to a point where banks were incredibly fragile. And when some event occurred, such as a shock in the housing market, that triggered the realization that banks have become so fragile that they were likely to collapse, hence the loss of confidence in banks. One of my uh, favorite memories with Mervyn is taking Mervyn and Larry Summers to dinner and <laughs> listening to the two of them talk economics. And uh, anybody who knows Larry Summers knows that he is not a man who's easily intimidated <laughs> intellectually. But for the first and maybe only time, I watched him, and this is sort of like a, you know, economist version of a of a face-off, basically get you know put in his place by Lord King. Um, so I, I do want to ask you just because it's a fascinating part of the book, uh, and it's the you know in the in the eye of the hurricane uh, part, uh, you describe. One of the themes of the, the book is that in this crisis, people kept thinking this was about liquidity, let's just pump more liquidity in the markets, and that the Bank of England was really maybe the first to realize that this was not about liquidity, hosing the markets with more money to conduct transactions, but about solvency, and that the basic capitalization of the banks was the problem. And you faced that, uh, if I remember, with Northern Rock. And maybe you could just describe what that was, you know, the, the this was like Lehman Brothers in that it was pretty tense. I mean, you were really on the edge. Uh, well, tell us a little bit what that was like. So Northern Rock was a, was a very interesting example of a bank that basically did one simple thing. It lent money for mortgages, and then it packaged those mortgages and sold them in what was known as the market for securitized mortgages, mortgage-backed securities. When people realized that house prices could go down and not just always up, then they realized that the pieces of paper which represented the claim on repayments of mortgages could no longer be valued simply by saying, well, we don't care whose mortgages these are because we'll get the house back and that will re repay the loan. Uh, it actually mattered if house prices could go down whose mortgages they were. And no one had any idea whose mortgages they, they were. These pieces of paper didn't describe the characteristics of the persons whose mortgages they were, their zip codes, their incomes, anything at all. So the market just shut. So Northern Rock suddenly found that its business model ended literally overnight. You know, it, it, if it lent any more mortgages, how on earth would it finance them? And it couldn't. So we actually drew a, a line on a chart just saying, well, we know when Northern Rock will run out of money because the loans it's got will simply not be rolled over mm -hmm. and it will come to an end. Now, the, the, the extraordinary thing about Northern Rock was that it had an annual general meeting uh, a few months before it failed. And it said, on the basis of the new international regulations, we are the best capitalized bank in Britain. And we propose to return capital to shareholders. <laughs> Within a matter of two or three months, it had run out of money which is quite a good definition of insolvency. <laughs> and uh, the bizarre thing was that the ratio of the total liabilities of the bank to its own shareholders' funds was over 80 to 1. Mm -hmm. That's called leverage. Mm -hmm. So it was the most highly leveraged bank 
in the UK, despite the fact that it met all the international regulations. At that point, I started to lose confidence in the international regulations, <laughs> as other people lost confidence in Northern Rock. Um, and we could tell when it was going to run out of money, and it did. So the next year, we spent our time urging the banks to, to acquire more capital in order to earn the trust of the financial markets. And the, the interesting thing, and why the phrase alchemy is relevant, I think, is that before the crisis, we know that actually banks didn't need to have very much equity finance in order to persuade people to lend to the banks. No one believed a bank could get into serious trouble or could fail. So people were quite happy to lend to banks, even though they had these extraordinary high leverage ratios. After the crisis, they were asked the question, how much equity finance did a bank need to have to attract people's trust or confidence? A hell of a lot was the answer, and far more than the regulators were saying the bank should have. In other words, the loss of innocence in the banking system was so great that actually it would take a long time for banks to earn it back. Now, the fact that the US authorities moved pretty swiftly in 2009 here, and the UK moved in uh, late 2008, helped our banking systems earn back some of that trust. But in Europe, in China, in, in, in parts of Asia, uh, the banking system is still very fragile, and trust is, is tenuous. And I, I should ask you, uh, because it, it's something we all think about, it's part of our political campaign, um, this uh, near-death experience for our financial markets uh, in 2008-2009 uh, shattered trust, but led to a, a lot of reforms led to a process of stress testing of banks, led to different standards for bank capitalization. Um, and I think this audience would be interested in, in whether you feel that uh, our financial system, uh, the UK financial system, really are in better shape now. You, you said other countries, you still have concerns, but should we have confidence that these stress-tested institutions now are sound? So I think if you look at this in the historical context, and in particular examine the 19th century history of this country, what you see is there are two reasons why you might be concerned about a bank. One is that it's, some of its loans will go sour, it will lose money, it could become insolvent. Now, <clears throat> the amount of equity finance banks have which can absorb those losses is a crucial feature in preventing insolvency. And our banks have about twice as much equity finance as they did before the crisis. So they're better off. I mean, I w and they're not in a great position, but they're much better off than they were. That's not true in the rest of Europe, but it's true in the US and the UK. However, the feature of the banking system in the 19th century was regular and frequent bank runs. That is, as people lost confidence in a bank, didn't quite know what, how sound it was, they thought, well, rather than mess around, I'll take my money out and either put it in a different bank or keep it in the mattress or whatever. Uh, and banks are very vulnerable to bank runs. And of course, as we saw one in 2008, where it wasn't ordinary people that were taking their money out, it was other financial institutions like money market funds that were running on the banking system. If that leads to the need for the central bank, like the Fed, to throw money at the problem, well, maybe you can rescue the banks. But it generates a loss of confidence in the economy, which led to a very deep recession, which is a costly thing to have. So it would be a jolly good idea to get rid of bank runs. Now, it's very interesting that in the next 100 years after the Federal Reserve was created, that many of the most famous American economists decided that fractional reserve banking, that is a banking system where the bank doesn't have enough reserves to pay out the deposits in one go, was a bad idea. And we should get rid of fractional reserve banking. And many of the great names, Fisher, Knight, you know, Friedman, Tobin, or it thought this was a jolly good idea. It's never happened. So why is that? Actually, because it's not such a good idea. <laughs> and the reason is that if you insist on that, then you end up with banks that can create deposit accounts for us all, but they're not allowed to do anything with the money apart from buying government securities. Well, the banks are then safe, but the trouble is we haven't got anyone to finance lending to business or mortgage lending, so who is going to do that? Well, answer came with none. So in the book, what I put forward is a, an idea for a different approach. Uh, the traditional role of a central bank as lender of last resort, 
which is, I mean, when, when the Fed threw money at the banking system in 2008, you could hear them mumble, Badgett, lender of last resort, to explain what they were doing. And this is an old idea which Badgett had in the 19th century. Actually, Walter Badgett wrote his famous book, Lombard Street, a stone's throw from Centre Court Wimbledon. So tennis keeps coming back to these things. And Mervyn, among other things, if you look at the royal box uh, at Wimbledon, you, you will see Mervyn. It's always interesting to see who Mervyn is sitting next to near. This is one of the many reasons why you really would like to be Mervyn King if you could come back. <laughs> so, uh, so Lombard Street. Lombard Street. So Badgett had the idea that in a crisis, it was important to lend to banks, otherwise they would fail and cause a collapse of, it's a bit like electricity failing and the economy not being able to function properly. If you can't make payments, pay bills, receive salaries, the economy starts to, to wind down. Now in his day, he said, look, we have no idea whether banks are really solvent or not, but it doesn't matter because banks have so much assets in the form of government securities that we can lend against it. And 30% of the assets of banks in his day were in the form of government securities against which the central bank was very happy to lend at a moment's notice without any inspection of the, this collateral that the bank was <coughs> leaving with the central bank in order to obtain cash. Fast forward to 2006, when banks wanted to borrow from central banks, the total proportion of their assets in this form that they could bring to the Fed for example, to obtain cash, was not 30% of their assets, but less than 1%. So when Royal Bank of Scotland rang me up one day and said, terribly sorry, we can't get to the end of the day, and I could see Armageddon coming with the ATMs shutting and everything else, we had to lend against collateral, which took the form of people's mortgages. And I said to my staff, so what do we know about these mortgages? And they said, well, to be honest, Mr. Governor, Nothing. Uh, it could be Mrs. Jones at 17 Acacia Avenue. I said, do we know where Acacia Avenue is or who Mrs. Jones is? No, we don't. So we couldn't lend one for one against that. We had to lend a proportion of the value of the, of the mortgages. That's called a haircut. Central banks lending a certain proportion of it. It's actually a bit like a pawnbroker. You take the gold watch to the pawnbroker, he'll lend you some cash, less than the value of the gold watch, and sufficiently less to give you an incentive to come back and reclaim it and repay the loan. So my idea is that that's what we should do with central banks. Now, in 2007-8, the, the gold watches that banks brought, actually were, half of them were broken. But nevertheless, we had to make judgments about how much it was safe to lend. The trouble is, that's not the moment when you want to make decisions about how much to lend. You don't take out insurance after the accidents happen. You do it beforehand. So my idea is that we should make, should make banks take out the insurance before they're allowed to drive as operators banks. And what banks would do is, in normal times, when there's no crisis, no, nothing special going on, bring some of their assets to the central bank. Central bank would take a month or two to look at this, this collateral, value it. Uh, we have teams of people who can do that in central banks now. And they could say to themselves, OK, if at any point in the next five years you needed some cash in an emergency, you bring us these assets and we'll give you either 95 cents in the dollar, if it's a fairly easy to value uh, asset, or 55 cents in the dollar, or 25 cents in the dollar, or if the instruments are completely incomprehensible, incom nothing. <laughs> and in that way, the bank will know how much cash it would be able to get from the central bank in the crisis. And here's the key point. My rule would be that each bank must have enough collateral examined by and pre-positioned with the central bank that everyone would know that whatever a crisis happened, when, whenever it took place, but whatever type of crisis it was, that the bank would always be able to go to the central bank and get enough cash to repay all the depositors who could take their money out on demand. And in that way, there would never be a bank run again because nobody would have any incentive to join a bank run or to take their money out because they would know. Mm -hmm. Now, in this way, this doesn't, uh, this, banks can then choose what, they, what loans they make, to whom they lend, how they finance themselves with only one constraint. You don't need tens of thousands of pages of legislation 
to regulate banks. You have one rule which says in order to allow the central bank to play its role as pawnbroker for all seasons, to replace the lender of last resort, enough collateral must be positioned by the commercial bank with the central bank so that the central bank has said, we were willing to lend you this amount of cash. Now this may sound a bit airy-fairy, but what's interesting about it is that it would actually be relatively easy to do today because one of the accidental byproducts of the measures taken to restore the economy in the last few years has been the creation of money by central banks electronically through purchasing government bonds, QE as it's called. And the consequence of that is that when the central bank, the Fed, buys bonds from people in the market, people get a check written by the, the Fed. They deposit in their bank account. Their bank account is credited with, um, with money. And the commercial bank takes the check to the central bank, to the Fed, and the Fed credits the bank with money in its deposit account with the Fed. The result is that US banks today have, on average, 20% of their total assets in the form of deposits with the Fed. So their balance sheet is a lot safer than it was. Long may this last. Mm -hmm. But what it means is that if you've got a bank with a balance sheet of, say, 100, now it, it 20 is already completely secure in a form that the Fed would immediately give you cash on the spur of the moment. That leaves 80 of the other assets of loans of different kinds. Let's suppose that, on average, the Fed says, well, the haircut we would uh, impose on those assets is, on average, 50%. That means the Fed is saying, we guarantee you that as long as this collateral has been examined by us in advance, that you'll get 40 in cash, just like that, drop of a hat, whenever you need it. 40 plus 20, that's 60. It turns out that the proportion of the total funds raised by banks, equity finance, long-term debt, medium-term debt, and deposits, the share of deposits is about 60. So actually, we could make this work by giving banks, say, 10 years to preposition a lot of this collateral. And then the banking system would be as safe in the sense of avoiding bank runs as those American economists in the 20th century wanted. But you don't have to tell banks they have to split themselves into safe bits and then worry about who's going to finance the rest of the economy. And in, I would say keep current regulation for 10 years, get to the point where the alchemy has been ended, and then you say to the banks, OK, since you went along with this and you didn't lobby against it and you got to the end of the process, we'll then now, but only now, get rid of a lot of the regulation, the tens of thousands of pages that Dodd-Frank and other regulatory bodies have imposed, much of which seems to me to serve little purpose other than <coughs> the equivalent of the parent, you know, the parent in the kitchen looking out of the window. Suddenly the children are quiet. And what do you do? <laughs> you, you say, Johnny? I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but whatever it is, stop it. <laughs> and that is what we're doing to banks now. And it, it, it's unnecessary detailed regulation. So the pod broker for all seasons uh, is only one of the uh, ex extraordinarily interesting creative ideas in this book. Um, I'm going to quote Larry Summers, um, who says on the... Uh, shrewd man. Shrewd man. Um, Mervyn King may well have written the most important book to come out of the financial crisis. And to understand why that's true, you have to read it, and to read it, you have to buy it. But I'll say that for later. So um, I do want to leave time for uh, questions uh, from the audience before Mervyn uh, signs books. Um, maybe one last quick question for me, and then we'll turn to the audience. I would love it if you would uh, paint a word picture for this audience of a place that you and I love, uh, where we were both students, and that's K King's College, Cambridge, which is John Maynard Keynes's college, uh, was Joan Robinson's college. Uh, I'm sure you have memories of her, and can just briefly describe, because this book is in many ways a commentary on an elaboration of Keynes's economics. Just describe that uh, world of, of King's College economics. So at school, I, high school, I was a, a mathematician, and I thought, you know, I'd quite like to do cosmology. That was my aim. But I realized at school that 
to do cosmology at Cambridge, you had to do three years science first. And that meant doing experiments. And my wife will describe me charitably as the least practical person she has ever met. <laughs> so my, I, in chemistry, I got the top mark in theory. But in four years of doing experiments to identify compounds, you were given these substances and told to you know, heat them up and weigh them and do all kinds of things to them to identify them. I didn't get one right in four years. And you know, the, the burettes would drop out of the clamp and break on the floor. So I decided science perhaps wasn't the way to go. And the subject you could study where you didn't have to do experiments was economics. <laughs> and um, so, I w so, 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 so I went to, I went to Cambridge. Soon we had a can opener. Exactly. <laughs> so I went, I went to Cambridge to study economics. And why it was so exciting was that uh, people like Galbraith were giving the wreath lectures that year and were invited to lunch groups. And I, as a student, was invited along too. So there was a sense that you really were meeting people who were writing at the frontiers of the subject. But what happened in the time when I was an undergraduate was that the group of people in King's who were, they were disciples of Keynes. I mean, they were his junior colleagues and had worked with him on the general theory and gave him comments on drafts of it. They thought this man was God and that nothing useful could be said on economics after Keynes. As a result, they stood in the way, I think, of the application of mathematical approach to economics which produced many interesting insights. But, and this is a key point in, in the book, the way in which those mathematically inclined economists approached the subject led them into the temptation that they wanted to be like physicists. They thought economics could be like physics. There were laws of nature that we could discover. Now, the, 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 the proof that this is not true is given by one simple observation. As computing power has got bigger and bigger, meteorologists have got better and better at forecasting the weather because they build very complicated computer models. And because they are describing laws of nature, the more sophisticated those models, the more accurate the predictions. The opposite is true in economics. Because you're dealing with people and their behavior, the more complicated the model, the bigger the mistakes you are likely to make in assuming that the future will be like the past. And there are many examples of that. And the fact that people did not predict the financial crisis illustrates why economics is not like either meteorology or like physics. And Keynes was, was adamant in his, his writing that the world was characterized by what we now call radical uncertainty. That is, uncertainty that is so pervasive that you cannot imagine what the future holds. And if you can't do that, you certainly can't attach probabilities to future events. And you can't price risk. And the application of mathematics to economics led people in the area of finance to think that whatever risks there are out there could always be priced by creating new markets, new financial markets, new instruments will price all the risks. And yet, cr when crises come along, it's because something wholly unexpected happens that wasn't anticipated and wasn't priced. And, and this, I think, is, goes to the heart of why modern economics failed to understand the movement of the economy as a whole. I, I like the analogy between Newtonian physics and Einstein. So there are many situations in the world where Newtonian physics is a very good approximation to how the world works. And you can make calculations about the speed at which billiard balls rebound around the table and speed at which things fall from the ceiling onto the floor. There are lots of practical uses of Newtonian physics. But Einstein pointed out that in certain situations, you know, time and space get bent, and things are not des described well by Newtonian physics. And it's just the same in economics, that the application of mathematics in certain situations, for example, if people's incomes go up by 10%, how much are they likely to spend on food as opposed to holidays and other things. These things can be relatively stable, predicted, and they're very useful. And firms you know, selling products, thinking of uh, what, how much they should charge uh, for a product, can use these methods very sensibly. But when it comes to thinking about the future and big decisions which are 
which will, which will only be realized in the future, investment projects or saving for the future. To understand booms and slumps in the economy, it's like Einstein's theory of relativity. You need to think about expectations in a world of total uncertainty. And modern economics has thrown that out of the window. And as a result, the models which central banks use when they forecast the economy and decide on interest rates, believe it or not, have no role for money or banks at all. Money and banks are the institutions we created to deal with an unknowable future. So I have this vision of Keynes wandering around the River Cam, talking in words. And if you look at every now and then, the Sunday newspapers have a, a list of the 100 most important books written in the 20th century. And you're supposed to read them all or at least have them in the library. And the general theory of Keynes, the general theory of employment, interest, and money is one of those books. But if you've ever tried to read it, even I find that most of it is incomprehensible. Bits of it are wonderfully written and excellent. But a lot of it is Keynes trying to explain to other economists why the world is not, why the, why the economy, a market economy, is not self-stabilizing. And he found it very hard to explain. And what I try and do in the book is to explain it using the insights of modern economics to show why an economy is not necessarily self-stabilizing and why it's possible to have booms and slumps and why expectations are absolutely fundamental in those circumstances. So I would invite people to come to the microphones. There's one here and here. Uh, if you would line up, uh, keep your questions uh, brief, if you would, so we can get as many questions in as possible. Yes, sir, go ahead. I, I like the uh, correspondence of cosmology to economics because it's hard to do experiments in both. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was originally going to get up and ask, uh, I know there's a Nobel Prize for economics, but um, is it possible that economics is actually a science in the sense that you can do reproducible experiments? So the reason economics tried to become a science was that I remember as a student reading about macroeconomics, the behavior of the economy as a whole. And a lot of the stuff that was written was plausible, but it wasn't entirely rigorous. And what modern economics has done is to produce something that's completely rigorous, but not entirely plausible. <laughs> and, and the application of scientific methods, I think, is a good idea. So the collection of data, uh, the, the, the looking at observations in a systematic way, the application of statistics, these are scientific methods which have great value in economics. The big difference is that economics is not about discovering immutable laws of nature, which once you've discovered the law of nature, will be something you can rely on. Uh, and that is not true in thinking about how an economy behaves. And that's why I found during the crisis that all of the, the useful insights I had in thinking about the crisis did not come from studying mathematical or statistical models. They came from reading <coughs> financial history and seeing how many of the problems we faced had been faced in previous crises in one guise or another. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening. I was thinking uh, in the 1960s when I was studying economics, we were crowded out by the engineering students coming over to us, and uh, I decided to move on, got into the satellites. But now I'm back to Earth. Uh, last time here, I was here, I asked a question, and the, I think the uh, speaker politely told me that it was answered during the, uh, his delivery of discussion of the book, but I want to ask a question anyhow. It has to do with uh, the stability of our uh, economic system, where we're headed, and I think this phrase, uh, uh, too big to, uh, to fail, has been used a lot and maybe overused. And I was thinking, uh, which is a dangerous thing, maybe the phrase should be uh, too big to uh, be held accountable. Uh, what, what were the standards 30 years ago on accountability in the financial world? Uh, what are they today and what will they be, uh, where are we headed right now? That's my question. Well, it's a big question, and there isn't a simple answer to it. I think it's fair to say that regulation is a lot more intrusive today. So it's not that we've sort of abandoned regulation. 
Um, but banks have become very big. In the last 30 years, banks grew very rapidly, and the biggest banks grew the fastest. Um, not clear that's necessarily a good thing. And the, the biggest change, I think, was that for one reason or another, investment banks, which are based on a trading mentality in part at least, were taking over commercial banks and the individuals who were running these big banks came more from the trading side than the commercial side. Now to run a retail bank, it, I think it's closer to running a supermarket. You've really, got to, you've really got to understand what the customers want. If you're in a trading operation, there aren't any customers as such, you're trying to do deals. The culture of these two types of institution is very, very different. And it's not obvious that it's a sensible idea to put them into one institution where the culture is, is very different. And we certainly, I think, got to a point where, I don't think the size of banks was the biggest problem in the crisis, but it has been an issue because the phrase I use in the book is that banks, because they were large and, and central to the way the economy operated, governments couldn't let them fail. And because they were so large and important to the economy, the US prosecutors here found it very difficult to go ahead with prosecutions where they would have done it for a very small bank, but were worried about the impact on stability of the financial system if they were to prosecute a big bank. And where the banks were so large that whether or not the shareholders could hold them accountable, the managers found it very hard to manage what was going on. So you have HSBC suddenly discovering there was a lot of money laundering going on in its Mexican operations, tax evasion, illegal tax evasion in its Swiss operations. So I think you could use the phrase, you know, banks had become too big to fail, too big to jail, and too big to sail. <laughs> uh, and and th this is a problem which the market, I think, is now beginning to correct. It is very striking that since the crisis, the size of the biggest investment banks has shrunk. Uh, some banks are actually splitting off operations between commercial and investment of their own accord. Um, many of the Swiss banks that have got very big by creating large investment banks, shutting down the investment banks, going back to their traditional successful role of wealth management. So I don't think we should, we should um, ignore the fact that people now realize they've, you know, that, that we've learned a lot from the crisis and the people running banks realize that maybe the setup before was not the most efficient or effective way of doing it. But as I say, when it comes to regulation, I don't think, I'm not a great fan of incredibly detailed legal regulation. What I am a fan of is saying, why are we worried about banks? Answer, because they could become insolvent or because they could generate a bank run. If we could solve those two issues, at least make a big dent in them, we'd have gone an awfully long way to make the banking system safer without having to have a large number of highly intelligent, very competent, and presumably well-paid people as lawyers and compliance officers, uh, even legislators, putting in place a regulatory system that doesn't actually have a lot of social value. So let me ask each questioner to keep the question short so we can get as many in as we, as we possibly can. Yes, sir. Who buys a debt instrument with a negative interest rate and why? <laughs> well, it's not clear that many people today are buying it, but the question is what's the alternative? And if you are very nervous about the future, you may be willing to accept a safe capital value at the cost of p repaying some instrument, uh, some interest to others. Now, this is not likely to be very successful for the reason that I gave, if a mortgage borrower is being paid to borrow, this is likely to cause serious problems. And I think, again, one of the consequences of economists relying on mathematical models is that the view you will see expressed by most economists every day in the newspapers is that if only we could get interest rates low enough, negative enough, then people would suddenly spend more. I don't think that is true. And the reason why is that the models economists use are far too simple. If I were to tell you tomorrow, because this is what many economists advocate, though they don't describe it in these words, if I told you tomorrow that for the next year, there'll be a wealth tax imposed by the government of 5% on any of your assets fixed in money terms, economists would say, well, you'd rush out and spend. I think it's just as likely that you'd say, what the hell are these people doing? And what on earth are they going to do next year? And you'd say, well, maybe I should pull in my horns, if not 
get, get your wealth out of the country altogether. Uh, but the, this is why expectations are so important and, and why economic models typically are far too simple. So I sympathize with your concern. Yes, sir. Mervyn, glad to see you here. I have not had the pleasure of, uh, sir, of reading your book yet, but I have read some a little bit about the book, and, uh, and I know one of your themes in general is globalization and how national barriers don't work or money and national barriers don't match up. And in particular, you have some observations on the whole uh, European experiment, and I think it would be useful for the audience to uh, hear you on that, which I'm sure will be appropriately provocative, as if you haven't been provocative enough. So I'm sure the audience would benefit from hearing you on the world economy. And Mr. Truman, one of the Fed's greatest exponents of international economics. I'm very critical of the euro area in the, in the book because I point out that there is a natural relationship between nations democratic legitimacy and decisions on, on money. And the European Union started the Euro Area project from the very best of motives. The idea was to bind Germany in to a project uh, such that the rest of Europe will never again fear Germany as an overwhelming dominant power in Europe. To do that, Germany sacrificed the Deutschmark, the one symbol of great post-war German success, something which the German nation itself valued enormously. Um, and they, they were willing, after exactly 50 years, to give up the Deutschmark and join the monetary union, with the objective that never again would Germany seem too powerful. What has been the consequence of this? The result is that Germany is more powerful economically and politically today than it was before monetary union was created. And that's because other countries in the Euro area, after monetary union started, lost competitiveness against Germany, and as a result, built up large trade deficits, if they were at full employment, and in effect had to borrow from the rest of the world, and now in effect are gonna have to borrow from Germany. That puts Germany in the driving seat of the European economy. We have mass unemployment in the south of Europe, and Germany with a massive trade surplus of 8% of GDP. When I was a student in Cambridge, we looked at photographs from the 1930s and of the Great Depression. And we knew why it happened, because the people making decisions just looked like old fuddy-duddies. They had hats and whiskers. They didn't study modern economics. They hadn't heard of Keynes at that point. It's not surprising it was a disaster. It would never happen with us. What's happened in Greece in the last few years is worse than the experience of the United States in the 1930s. I never thought it was feasible for a modern industrialized economy in Europe to experience something worse than the Great Depression. Surely, of all the things we had learned, we knew how to stop that happening again. But it's become part of the inevitable process of monetary union. Now, it's very striking that two or three weeks ago, the central bank governors of France and Germany published a joint article saying what the euro area needs now is a single finance minister to take decisions on taxes and spending for every country in the euro area. I dread to think of how many people will vote for extreme political parties around Europe if they are told that their national government, the government they elected, no longer can set taxes and spending for their own country. It's been taken out of their hands and given to an unelected group of bureaucrats in Brussels. That is a recipe for going back to the disaffection with governments in Europe that we did see in the 1930s. And there are far more parallels with what's going on in the Euro area today with the 1930s than I care to, to mention. Some and we should be worried some about Some parallels it. here too, some, some of us think. Uh, sir. With respect, let's just follow up on the Euro perspective. Your, your position with respect to Brexit, Britain's exit, um, I'm curious to hear, since you've been there, what are the pros, what are the cons, as well as a different type of question, the concept of fintech, the concept of uh, Bitcoin as well as blockchain. Well, I'm going to answer your last question. I won't do the first one because 
the, although I'm sure you're very eager to know my views, it's three and a half months to go before the referendum, and I'm still waiting for either side to give a set of coherent arguments for or against. <laughs> um, <coughs> but I'm not going to take a public position because uh, I don't want to put my successor in a difficult position, which I would do by anything I said. The FinTech is interesting because when I was teaching last fall at NYU, I'd ask how many of the students had purchased a Bitcoin. And actually, quite a large number had. And when I asked, I asked them why that was the case, it was clear that they weren't quite sure why they'd done it, but it was a bit like owning an Apple or doing something exciting in, in, in high tech. I don't think Bitcoin will ever uh, become a successful currency. The fraction of transactions used with Bitcoins is very, very, t very small indeed. The reason is because it goes back to this question of trust in money and alchemy. Right? Now, this is digital money. If you want to know how much trust you should place in digital money, you ought to have some feeling as to whether you trust the issuer of Bitcoins. Do you really know either who started it or what the algorithm is that's going to determine the ultimate supply of Bitcoins? I'm sure I don't. And I don't really want to trust my money to that setup. And it's very striking that the price of Bitcoins has been unbelievably volatile. So it's a kind of digital gold, but without the knowledge and security, which we all can have, that if you decide you want to hold gold, at least you can be pretty confident that the supply of gold in the world in the short run is pretty much fixed. Can't be doubled easily, can't be halved easily, it's fixed. Now, that, I'm not saying gold is a good thing to invest in or that it can be used successfully as a currency, but at least the supply of it is known. I don't think we really understand the algorithms which generate the supply of digital currencies. Please. Thanks for the talk. Um, understanding that we've touched on a lot of this, uh, I have a two-part question. Both can be very short answers, though. Uh, what do you view as the single biggest threat to the global financial system? Is it uh, globalization and interconnectedness, financial engineering, um, market structure and technology? And on the flip side, what do you think is the highest value thing that can be done to shore up the system? Is it something like a counter-cyclical buffer that uh, would prevent something like a bank run? So I don't think the biggest threat are any of the things that, that you mentioned. I think it's the macroeconomic policies pursued by governments around the world. Historically, where banks have lost a lot of money is where there's been a, a, a mistake in monetary or macroeconomic policy. And I think the, that's my biggest concern at present. Um, the best way of dealing with it is, as I said, this very simple two-part rule, a strong enough leverage ratio, and the pawnbroker for all seasons rule to prevent bank runs. Thank you. You've really already answered my question, so this should be, should be very short. I, while I was waiting for you to talk, I was reading The Industries of the Future by Alec Ross, who was here not too long ago. And um, one of those industries is digital banking, Bitcoin. And um, so I guess I'll make the point that one of the people he interviewed for this twice was Larry Summers, once in 2013, who was a little bit skeptical about it, like you. But by 2014, late 2014, he was much more enthusiastic about the potential for it to give trust, especially in kind of worldwide across the uh, uh, the lesser developed world, I guess you could say, in, in, as in, in substituting for their currency. So I guess my question, just to narrow it a little bit, would be if that came to be true and we had a lot more reliance on Bitcoin than we have right now globally, would that have made any difference in the, in the uh, monetary crisis of 2008? No, I don't think it would. And I don't think that, I mean, I think you should distinguish between Bitcoin on the one hand and digital banking on the other. Okay. It, it, you could easily imagine a system. This is, I think, the sort of thing that Larry says we will discover in the future where we go. Let's suppose that we made our transactions using a card, but instead of transferring money from my account to your account, when I come to your restaurant, for example, what we do instead is my card would have a very fancy algorithm on it. And when I paid $50 to you in your restaurant, the algorithm would automatically sell stocks and shares, which I own, on the market. The algorithm would be 
would link to your card, and your card would have an algorithm that says, when something worth $50 is sold by your restaurant, you get the money. Uh, but, but you don't get money, you get a number, 50, and your algorithm buys stocks and shares according to a predetermined algorithm. And so you don't need to hold money at all. Money would disappear. It would all be digital transactions. Now, I used to think there was some future in that in the, in the long run because real-time transactions mm. could take place. What we've learned from Michael Lewis's book, not the big short, but um, the, um, the Flash Boys, is that what's interesting is, of course, nothing happens in real time. Even electronic transactions can at most go at the speed of light. And some people have worked out how to get their transactions to move faster than others. <laughs> so if you and I were making transactions, say, in a restaurant, through buying and selling shares, you can be absolutely certain that there'll be some flash boys outside <laughs> trying desperately to get their messages to the stock market faster than you and I could get our messages. And when it's just a question of buying and selling the stock market, as it is today, it can be relatively easily managed. But if every transaction in the economy <laughs> goes through this digital banking type of approach, there is massive scope for people front running all our transactions. So I don't think money or cash will ever actually disappear. So the important economic transaction tonight is actually buying books. <laughs> and I am going to ask, um, let's just get four more questions, two from here, two from here, and then come back to Mervyn for final words, and then we will sell books. Uh, my question is about uh, the porn broker for all seasons. Uh, Mervyn has, uh, I think, described this as only applying to banks. So what about large non-banks? Uh, will they uh, also uh, uh, be required to do this? Uh, and if they're not, won't activity move to the non-bank sector? Or what, what role would the pawnbroker have with respect to non-banks? So I think, I mean, it's a good question. We're a very high-powered audience today. Um, it, the pawnbroker rule has to apply to any institution that above a certain day minimis level offers runnable deposits. So any institution that creates deposits which can be called in on demand would be subject to this rule. Um, yes, please. Um, I was curious about this core proposal that you were presenting earlier with respect to this insurance mechanism uh, with respect to banks and banks depositing uh, some assets with the central bank that might later be called if needed. I was curious how that would be different given that the value of this asset is highly cyclic, cyclical. So and how, and how is this different if actually as compared to just simply increasing the, the capitalization of, of banks and er raising the, uh, the capital requirement of banks? Because when the cycle does hit the low, these banks, for example, uh, can still put them forward at 25 cents of the dollar, and it probably would be the same valuation that the central bank would give when accepting these assets as a deposit for insurance. So the point is that the central banks will choose the haircuts conservatively because it's making a commitment for a long period, five years or possibly longer, and saying at any point in that period, if you bring this collateral, this is the number of cents in the dollar that you'll get in cash. And you've got to have enough of that well in advance of the problems occurring. So it's, it's in that sense, it's <coughs> building in some stability into the system. And it automatically acts as a break on excessive lending in good times. But because it prevents bank runs, it prevents the decline in lending that we saw occurring in 2009 after the crisis. Let's make this the last question on my yeah. right. Well, thank you, and thank you for coming. I can't wait to read the book. Um, I have a question about trade. Um, and uh, I teach economics at GW, and so I'm always trying to find easy ways to explain complicated things. I actually teach tax. But uh, a couple weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal had an article about how we need to teach economics at a younger and younger age. And so they asked a bunch of sixth graders, you know, what's the most important economic principle? And the answer is that free trade is good because you get to consume more things. Lately, a lot of really smart economists have been saying, you know, trade is not such a great thing. So can you give me a non-textbook answer to the people like Carrier Air Conditioning <laughs> who lost all their jobs when the factory moved to Mexico about why trade is still a good thing? Well, of course, clever economists can prove almost any proposition, and that's, 
in a sense, that's what you get a PhD for, which is demonstrating something no one really <laughs> believed can actually be true. Um, and, <clears throat> and I do think that, in, in general terms, one of the reasons why the post-war period was a, a time of prosperity and rising living standards was because, after the Second World War, we went back to an open trading system and encouraged trade. And different countries have different individual products, different ideas, different processes, and we all learn by, from each other, and the best way of doing that is, is through trade. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I will be in favor of trade, and indeed I think in our current situation, where we're struggling to find ways of improving productivity, I think that the industrialized world has a, a, an opportunity now to say to the major emerging market countries, look, you, you in effect stop the Doha round from making any further progress. So what we're going to do is carry out a further round of trade liberalization within the industrialized world, but in services. Focus it on services, which now account for the bulk of things that we produce, and increasingly can trade too. So, um, you know, I think if you put children into a room and they look across the room and say, well, I'd quite like to have some of that, they soon get the idea that trading and swapping things <laughs> is quite a good idea. So you can imagine what it was like to have Mervyn as your tutor. Uh, please join me in thanking Mervyn, Lord King.